everybody. It's your Uncle Jim. How you doing? Good to be back, back here on Kidney Stories with uh, my friends. Um, we're going to have uh, Dr. Kramer on tonight, the president of the National Kidney Foundation. Uh, she had a little trouble uh, accessing the show from the network at work. Apparently, uh, the hospital <laughs> wouldn't let her do it. So she's on her way home, and uh, she's going to try to access us from home. So in the, the meantime, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the back end of the show to the front of the show, and uh, we have a, a couple of things uh, to discuss. Um, first, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for the support that you gave me while I was ill. I was in the hospital last week. I had some uh, internal bleeding. Uh, my hemoglobin was very low, and I was kind of weak and dizzy. Uh, so I was in the Munster Community Hospital here in Munster, Indiana. Uh, they took very, very good care of me. Uh, excellent nursing, excellent doctors that don't have any complaints. Um, just would like to give a shout out and uh, thank them all for looking after me and uh, making sure I'm okay. Kidney's fine, by the way. My transplanted kidney uh, is doing very well. The creatinine numbers were, were good. So, um, and I've tried to be on my good behavior since. Uh, I've been home. Um, I also wanted to thank everybody. I, I made a post uh, when I got home to let everybody know that I was back. Uh, terrific response uh, to that post. So many friends and uh, uh, kidney patients and kidney advocates uh, responded. I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you. Your support is overwhelming. It makes the guy feel pretty good. And uh, oh, Martin, Martin, thanks, Martin. I appreciate Martin Petrog. Uh, prayers for them. So I appreciate that very much, Mark. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody and uh, let you know that I'm very, very appreciative of uh, your support and your friendship. Um, the other thing is this week, our friend uh, Steve Belcher put up a petition on Facebook. And uh, I hope you saw it. Uh, it's a, a petition that discusses the fact that uh, DeVita has placed many of their dialysis centers in poor urban uh, areas and not placed them so much in um, other rich, more affluent areas. And the idea behind the petition is, first of all, for them to clean up their act. If you've ever seen any of Steve's videos, you'll see that there's garbage around those areas. I, I remember one of them, there was a, a, a car that wouldn't start that was in the parking lot. Oh, thanks, Deb. Deb Darcy, glad you're feeling better. I appreciate that. Um, and the fact that, uh, not only that, but they're always near like a McDonald's or a fast food place. If you're from here in, in Indiana on uh, Calumet Avenue, uh, you know that between Hammond and Munster, Indiana, which is just like a hop over a bridge, there are three um, dialysis centers, centers uh, two for Sinius, one DeVita. Um, they're all, you know, always near the McDonald's, the Wendy's, the Arby's, the, the Taco Bells, uh, those, those kind of things. So it, it doesn't exactly encourage good diet. Hey, my friend Lisa Baxter. How are you, Lisa? Thank you for checking in. Um, so what Steve is asking in, in that petition is that that corporation, the DeVita Corporation, takes some social responsibility. Now, when, when you study uh, corpse, and, and uh, I have an MBA, so that's one of the things we spent a lot of time studying. One of the things that they talk about is social responsibility. And what that means in plain English is that when a corporation makes a decision, they can't just take into account their stockholders, the members of the board of directors, the fat cats that benefit. They have to take everyone into consideration, including the public, the people in the neighborhood, and the people that they cater to. For example, with DeVita, that would be dialysis patients. So everyone has to be included in those decisions. And one of the things that, that Steve and his group have been asking is that there, there be some public awareness, that there, there be some 
uh, billboards, uh, TV ads, magazine ads, ads on Facebook, reminding people about their responsibility toward kidney disease. In other words, you know, early detection and early treatment means that you have less of a, a risk with, with kidney disease. Uh, I'm a pretty good example of that because I have PDK, uh, polycystic kidney disease. It runs in my family. Um, I've lost five members of my family to polycystic kidney disease, including my dad, and uh, I have it. So, uh, for example, because of my history, when I went in and I was complaining to my family doctor, they did a urine test, they did a blood test. I flunked. Okay, a lot of blood in my creatinine, uh, very low GFR, straight to the hospital, spigot put in my neck uh, on dialysis the same afternoon. But because um, I was treated early, because I was detected early, I was 25 at the time, I'm 65 now, so 40 years of experience with this. Um, my dialysis was not as rough on me as it, it was on some of the other folks. And I was able to get on the list and stay on the list to obtain a kidney. My transplant was not as rough on me as it is on some, some other folks. My post-transplant uh, life has been fabulous. I mean, co compared to being on uh, dialysis, this, this is, you know, I can remember to take pills twice a day, right? I mean, we can handle that. That's not a big deal. Take your t pills twice a day, and it maintains your kidney. It keeps your kidneys from rejecting. So um, a little social responsibility from the DeVita Corporation would go a long way with a, a group of, of people, people that have kidney disease and don't know it. The National Kidney Foundation tells us that there are almost 40 million people, 37 million people in the United States that have chronic kidney disease, and most of them do not know it. And their circumstance when they go on dialysis is exactly the way I described. It's a very slow progressing disease. So, you know, you, you feel fine, you feel fine, you feel fine, you go on with your life. And then one morning you fall out of bed, you're, you're sick, you, you can't account for what's going on. You have to call an ambulance, go to the emergency room, you end up in the hospital. They do the test they should have done earlier on in your, your life. And by the afternoon, you have a catheter in your, your neck and you're taking your first dialysis. This is not the way to do this. And they should not be promoting or fail to promote the fact that people can avoid this, that there are things that, that people can do. And it, 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 they're very simple tests. I mean, you know, you're talking about peeing in a bottle and having them draw a little blood for them to determine. This. And unfortunately, because kidney disease is kind of, of silent and it mimics a lot of other diseases, um, this is the only way. Hey, Jared, how you doing? Jared Brown checking in. Hi, Jared. Um, this is the only way to detect this. And see, these guys have an economic stake in the outcome, so they are not taking social responsibility. They are, they are not considering everybody that they should consider, like the people in the neighborhoods where they, they put their centers, right? I live in Hammond, Indiana. That's an urban area, predominantly Afro-American, predominantly uh, other than uh, Caucasian type people here. It's, it's in, in my building, I'm a rarity, all right? There's, there's like maybe two or three of us and, and everyone else is a minority and there's, you know, 700 people in this building. So, um, and like I said, three centers, uh, a score of fast food restaurants, uh, the, the whole nine yards, just, just like Steve describes it. These people should take some social responsibility. They should tell, this group of people where they put their centers, where their friends and their neighbors, and they should tell them, look, this is what you need to do to avoid ending up here. This is what you need to do to avoid ending up on dialysis. This is what you need to do to lessen the impact of chronic kidney disease. So 
so it's not so bad later on because you know when when I was in dialysis and I, I've been in, in two different centers here in Northwest Indiana in my life, one in Crown Point, Indiana, one in Dyer, Indiana. I, and anytime I traveled at that time, uh, Washington, D.C., out west in Las Vegas, uh, Texas, uh, New York, uh, you know, you always got to dialyze when you're out of town in case, you know, people don't realize that, you know, arrangements have to be made ahead of time. Any, any center that I was ever in was packed, jam packed. I mean, you have to call ahead six weeks ahead when you travel just so you can get a chair. And they kind of control, you know, what shift you're on. You know, you could be early in the morning. You could be late in the evening. You could even be overnight, what they refer to as nocturnal dialysis. So these guys should take some social responsibility. They make a ton of money. I, I mean, think about this. Medicare does not negotiate medical bills. They don't try to negotiate them down. So whatever these groups want to charge, Medicare pays it. Medicare pays 100% of it. Okay, so that's that's why Steve is out there, why you see him out there on Sundays and you see him pointing to the DeVita signs and you see him walking around the building showing you the condition of the buildings. It's They should tell people in advance they should tell people in advance, this is the situation. Unless you want to end up with us, you need to go in, you need to get tested, you need to see your physician, you need maybe to alter your lifestyle, you need to take high blood pressure medication, you need to look after your diabetes, diabetes and high blood pressure, the number one and two causes of, of kidney disease. You need to do this now while you still can. OK, see, I, I was so lucky, uh, you know, it's the only only way I can characterize it. I was so lucky because of my family's history. My family doctor did not mess around. And not only did uh, he refer me to a nephrologist, but he also referred me to his old medical school, IU Health, down in Indianapolis. And I lived in Valparaiso at the time. So that's, you know, two and a half hour drive. But it was it was very, very important because when I went down to Indianapolis and that is a teaching hospital. And by that, I mean, they have doctors who are professors that teach other doctors how to be doctors. They have nurses that they teach there. They have techs that they teach there. They do dialysis there. They do transplant there. So, you know, I was in, in really, really good hands. I had some really, really good physicians. And I mean, the first thing they did was they they put me on high blood pressure medication because I had high blood pressure. And of course, I didn't know that at the time. They put me on a kidney diet. Uh, they had me, because I'm computer literate, they, they had me put together uh, a program where I could show them what my blood pressure was, what my temperature was uh, twice a day, uh, what uh, I was eating you know, diet so that, you know, the dietician could sit down and say, Jim, don't eat that, you know, no more steak, you know, some salad, something green, right? So, but that saved my life. That, that made the rest of my kidney life easier, okay? My doctor, Dr. Black was his name. Dr. Black took responsibility. He, he said to me, you need to do these things. And I did. Now, I was diagnosed when I was 25. I didn't end up on dialysis until I was 58. And they would have me come back every six months or so. And, uh, you know, we go through the whole thing. You know, they draw blood, pee in a bottle. I get weighed. They take my temperature. They take my blood pressure. They go over the chart with me that I prepared. You know, they gave me medication. I mean, they took real, real good care of me. So I was able to stay off of dialysis a long, long time. My, you know, when I was in, in dialysis, these people would come in. They come in in, in gurneys. They come in in wheelchairs. They come in in, in walkers. Uh, you know, many of them had to be carried in 
to dialysis and, and, and put in a chair. In the, the four years that I was on dialysis, I saw four people die on my shift. One lady uh, passed away. She couldn't have been more than a dialysis chair away from me. Okay, a short reach, maybe six feet, seven feet. Okay, that didn't happen to me. Uh, you know, I was lucky. I was lucky because somebody took responsibility to inform me, to teach me, to, to let me know what was going on. They weren't worried about making money. They weren't worried about their stock. They weren't worried about what Warren Buffett was going to think. They were worried about my health. That should be the, the primary concern. Think of the 37 million people that have chronic kidney disease and do not know it. The majority of those people do not know it. This is horrible. Steve is right. Something has to be done. Okay, they have to take responsibility. They make a heck of a lot of money off of kidney patients. They don't have to negotiate their price. They just pay it. Okay, Medicare just pays it, 100% of it. All right, so on my page, you'll find it. I'm sure you'll find it on the Urban Networks page. Get, seek out Steve's petition. Sign it. Share it. Share it on Facebook. Share it on Twitter, share it on Instagram, pass that baby around. You know, I, I would, I personally would like to see half a million signatures on that petition. I, I, I would like the kidney community to stand up and to say, this is important. Because I'll, I'll tell you why. You, you want to know why it's important? What about your family members? What about your children? What about your friends? What about your co-workers? What about the people that you know and you, you love, right? I, I don't know how you feel about it, but the way I feel about it, I, I have a son. My son's in his early 30s. He lives in Cincinnati. He works for the Cincinnati Reds. He uh, does authentics for them, you know, uh, autograph baseballs, jerseys, stuff like that. And most of my adult life, I, I feared for the fact that he could inherit my disease. Okay. Now he didn't, you know, his, his mother didn't have it. I had it 50, 50 chance. His number came up good. He doesn't have it. But I mean, think about it. Think about this. If you could prevent somebody from going through the things that you have gone through, as a kidney patient, because, you know, I don't know about you, but I should glow in the dark. I, I, I've had about every test uh, known to man. Some of them, <laughs> while I was on the waiting list, I, I had to take twice because the, the hospital in, in Chicago, uh, Rush Medical, would not accept a uh, test from uh, IU's tester or from uh, the tester at, at the University of Wisconsin. They had their own uh, testing. They did their own uh, blood work. Everything they did was the, the gold standard. No chemical stress test, baby. You know, you got an angiogram. You know, they, they, they stick that thing all the way up, up through you just the way you think. And then afterwards, you sit still for six hours watching the clock, wondering why you were ever born, just to find out if your heart's okay. But th the point is, is this. If, if you could prevent your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, your family, the people that you work with, the people that, that you know, your friends on Facebook, your friends on social media, wouldn't you want them to know about this? Wouldn't you want them to avoid this? Do you not want people to be aware of the risk of the ninth leading killer in the United States of kidney disease? So, my friends, let's you and I, let's make sure that people know about this. Let's make sure that people understand why Steve Belcher is out there on a Sunday, standing in front of a, a DeVito with a broken down car, with beer cans in the back, with vials of whatever it was in the back. A chair and blankets in front of one of their buildings that looked like somebody peed on it. 
Okay, why does he do that? He's trying to make them accept their social responsibility to the public, to the people that they make money off of, to the neighborhoods that they choose to put their dialysis centers in. Let people know. Take the tests, right? Take the tests. Pee in a bottle. Let them draw a little blood. Find out the truth. Are, are, are you a diabetic? You're at risk. Do you have high blood pressure? You're at risk. Do you have heredity like I have? Okay. You're at risk. You're at high risk. That's, that's not even to mention the COVID thing. Okay. Not even to mention that. We're going to talk about that tonight, too, hopefully when the, the doctor comes. But, you, you know, you could be on the high risk end of this. So, sign a petition, pass it around, tell people about kidney disease, tell them your kidney story, right? My name is Jim Myers. I'm 65 years old. I have polycystic kidney disease. I was diagnosed when I was 25. I went on dialysis when I was 58. I was transplanted at the age of 62, I'm 65 now. I just celebrated my fourth anniversary as a kidney transplant patient. Simple, right? Kidney story. Tell them your kidney story. Tell them, you know, the next time you go to your doctor, the next time you have a physical, the next time you have a checkup, insist that your physician draw a little blood, have you pee in a bottle, and check your creatinine, check your GFR, check to see if you have kidney disease, check to see if you have issues. You know, that early check in my life, that early detection, that good early care and treatment is the only reason that your Uncle Jim is still sitting here tonight, still speaking to you. That's that's it, man. Okay, just being real level with you. So, I, I I see you know I see Steve out there. I see him doing these things. I see him making these statements. I see him working. This guy is the hardest working guy in kidney land, man. I see him him out there 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 working, and I I, I constantly see in the comments why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? Why is he out there on on a Sunday? Why isn't he, why didn't he take Sunday off, right? It's Sunday. Well, why isn't he home? You know, why isn't he taking it easy? It's, it's because he knows, like I know, like you know, that this is an insidious disease, that people are not aware that they have it or might have it, that it's a very, very simple Check. It's an easy check. Ten minutes and you're out of there. Okay. It's it's, it's not a a big deal. And you need those. Just so you know, it's it. Those of us that have kidney disease, it's not like, you know, they do this the first time and they okay, Jim's got kidney disease. I mean, they 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 draw blood. They have me pee in a bottle every time. Every time I go in to see the doctor, every single time I go to my transplant center, right? They take blood from me. They still check. They want to know my levels. This keeps me healthy. Then, then they know, can you see? Then they know what medicine to give me and how much. And, and see, this is my anti-rejection medication for, for my kidney, right? They, they know what they're supposed to give me. They know how to treat me and care for me. You're better off knowing than not knowing. Knowledge is power, my friends. Knowledge is power. And you're better off being in the know about your kidney disease because then you can take care of it. Then you can monitor it. There's no cure for it, okay? I'm not going to lie to you. There's no cure. Even when you get a kidney transplant, that's what they call renal replacement therapy 
therapy. It's just another form of treatment that takes the place of dialysis. But it's a much nicer one between you and me. Okay, that's my opinion. I know there are some people that really like dialysis, that enjoy their dialysis, that are concerned about the costs of anti-rejection medication after they're on dialysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all legitimate concerns. And I certainly don't want to talk anyone out of their dialysis that, that wants to do it. But I'm just telling you, my personal opinion, transplant is, is better. It's a, been a much better way of life for me. Um, but as advocates, one of the things that we have to do is to concentrate and raise awareness. We can't just count on people like Davida. We can't count on people like Fresenius. We can count on people like the National Kidney Foundation, like the American Association of Kidney Patients, like the American Kidney Fund. Those are a few of the groups I, I belong to. Like, yeah, kidney warriors, kidney warriors globally. Yeah, you count on kidney warriors, you can count on this network. Okay, you can count on the Urban Kidney Network to tell you the truth. All right? So we, we can be kidney giants. We have to do our part. We have to raise awareness about kidney disease. We can't count on anybody else. We have to count on ourselves. All right? You've, you, I bet you've heard this expression before. You have to be your own best advocate. Right? You have to be your own. I, I just got out of the hospital. You know, if there were things that I didn't want them to do to me, I have a right to tell them no. All right? So, you know, you have to be your own best advocate. You have to look out for yourself. You have to educate yourself. But in the meantime, these people that make so much money off of us, they have a responsibility too. Now, it's not, they don't, they don't have a product like cigarettes where they knew it was bad. They injected it into the, the stream of commerce and made a whole bunch of people sick while they sat silent and people got cancer and died. So litigation, not going to work here okay petitions like steve's will work here as long as people like you and me support it okay so find it share it sign it pass it around make it known there, there is no good reason why we can't have a number of signatures on this and, you know, no, nobody works harder than Steve Belcher. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a hard worker. This guy is a real, I, I'm too old to work like he does, okay? But he is a hard worker, and he has made this point over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, okay? This, this is not personal. He's not discussing his personal issues. This is the truth. OK, so please sign the petition and pass it around. Now, uh, one other thing I want to talk to you about. There's a petition from the National Kidney Foundation uh, as well. And I, I am I am asking you to go to the NKF's website, to go to the National Kidney Foundation's page on Facebook, to go to the National Kidney Foundation's page on Twitter. If you can't find it. Contact me, right? My email, kidney stories at hotmail.com. And you guys know I'm all over Facebook, right? So you can find me and I'll send you the link and, and you can sign in. This, this is important because this addresses issues for kidney patients, advocates, family members, caretakers to share some of these important initiatives, like making sure that dialysis patients have access to personal protection equipment, like making sure that our healthcare providers have access to personal protection equipment so they, you know, don't run out, right? And, you know, I was in a hospital recently, right? So I noticed that, that when I was there, and I've been asked to write a blog about this, so keep your eyes out for that, okay? Um, I noticed when I was there that every time a nurse or an aide 
or a lady that's picking up the trash, a social worker uh, came into to my room. They were masked. They were gowned. They were gloved. And th they came in, they were like gloves, plastic gloves in a box in the room. They put on the gloves before they talked to me, touched me, anything. They always maintained uh, a good social distance, six feet. They always had a mask. Some of them had a mask in the shield over their, their face. So, you know, it's it, even in a, a, a non-COVID area, it's very important that they have access to this personal protection equipment. That's for your protection, right? You understand that, right? One of these, one of these babies, and this is, I got this through the mail, okay? I know it's a cheap one, but, you know, it works for me. I, I, I've been outside like five, six times since it started. So, um, you know, I try to take care of myself. But, you know, one of these, right? And, and the other thing is the NKF wants to prioritize COVID testing. Now, when, when you have a country with as many people as, as we have, and you have a pandemic like this, and you test between one and 2% of the people that, that are involved in this, that ain't good enough. Okay, Here, let me show you something else. Wow, my this is this is from my building. Okay, I don't know if, if you can see that, but they're doing COVID testing in my building. I, I've been been through it once already. It's it's not a big deal. They they take a cotton swab, they stick it up your your nose. It, it it's over in a matter of seconds. It's just not that big a deal. Um. But we need to prioritize testing because, because kidney patients, people with kidney disease, people on dialysis, people with kidney transplants that take immunosuppressants, right? We're in a higher risk group, my friends. We're in a higher risk group. So because of that, testing has to be, pro we, we need to know, right? We need to know. If we have it or if we don't, do we need to quarantine or do, or do we not? Do we need to call our transplant center? Do we not? Do we need to call our dialysis center? Do we not? Do we need to be segregated when we're in dialysis or isolated when we're in Do we not? We need to know because we're at high risk. So testing for us has to be prioritized. Testing patients in nursing homes. Doesn't that make sense to you? Right? Doesn't that make sense? I mean, when they talk about these these outbreaks, areas where, where people cohabitate, live together in close areas. Th that's how this spreads. The, they don't even know the numbers in nursing homes, which is unbelievable that they, they would not have some idea how bad this is. But those people should be tested, right? I mean, just because you get old, doesn't mean you're discardable. That 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 concept is is so foreign to me. All right, elective surgeries, critical elective surgeries, uh, should should go forward. Right, things like uh, if you need a fistula. Right, if you need a graft. If you need a port. So you can do peritoneal dialysis. These have been termed like elective surgeries, and some of these have been delayed for some people, which, you know, a catheter, right? I, I, I've been through this catheter thing twice. Do you know how long it took them to put in uh, my catheter? And I was awake the whole time. It, it couldn't have been more than 20 minutes, right, both times. And coming out is even easier. It's like, you know, they take the stitches out and pull the thing out and it, it, it's done. So, and Steve has shown you those, those catheters, right? So nothing to be afraid of. But, but at any rate, some of these surgeries have been canceled. That's delayed people from going on dialysis. That's hurt their, their health. That's delayed people from going on hemodialysis using their fistula, which is the preferred method. Why? Because the catheter goes in to your heart. 
And of course, if you have an infection, that could go to your heart. And this is not a good thing, my friends. This is a bad thing. We do not want that. So uh, peritoneal dialysis. If you prefer to dialyze at home during the time of the COVID crisis, you're probably safer than if you're dialyzing in a crowded dialysis center, right? I mean, that makes some sense. A lot of people want to dialyze at home now. So those elective surgeries, we want them to go through. We, we want them uh, to be done so people can do their dialysis, so people can do their home dialysis, right? We, we, we want people to maintain good health, to feel better. I don't know about you, but before I went on uh, dialysis, there was one, one period of time where I knew I was real sick, okay? And I knew I was not doing well. And I believe the expression is Uncle Jim was in trouble, all right? And my, uh, my phone was on my bed. I was on my bed. I had my head up at the head of the bed. My phone was near the foot of the bed. I wasn't strong enough to easily reach my phone. Okay, that's how sick I really was. All right, and I began to panic because I thought, man, I can't call 911 without that big. So it's very, very important that this, these things be done. Um, meds. The, the National Kidney Foundation's petition talks about having 90 days worth of meds. Up, oh, I think the doctor's here. That's good. Whew. Okay, bring the doctor on, Steve. We're ready. Uh, 90 days uh, worth of meds, right? In this, in this period of time, you don't want to be running back and forth to the pharmacy. Uh, you don't want to have them mail you 30 days worth of meds uh, for a month in case something gets lost in the mail or things go bad. You want to have enough medication to last you for a while. To let, to let you know. <laughs> you're on the dance and clock, clock and ad living for 40 minutes. Oh my God. Oh, no. oh. oh my God. How are I you tonight? You have your pen on. You have your yeah. giant pen. That's awesome. That's, that's I right. saw I'm that. Like, giant. Oh, that's so cool. You are my, truly a kidney giant, too. You so deserve <laughs> that pen. Out of all the people I've given that pen to, you are the kidney giant. Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you're with us. Can you hear me okay? Uh -huh, yeah, can you hear me oh, okay? Boy, is... Yeah, yeah, you, you kind of froze up there for a minute, but I, I think we're all right now. So okay. um, I, I, I had this long introduction plan, so I, but I'm going to make it short and sweet for the, the, <laughs> the benefit of, of time. Th this is my good friend, Dr. Holly Kramer. Dr. Kramer is the president of the National Kidney Foundation, and anything in nephrology that could be done, trust me, she's done it. So <laughs> we're very, very pleased to have you with us today. Let, yeah, let's, let's, get, to be let's get into the questions. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your connection to kidney disease. Why, why did you go into nephrology, and as deep, deeply as you have? Can, can you explain that for us, please? Yeah, well, um, so my mom uh, was a dialysis nurse, and she actually started, um, helped to start the one, one of the very first uh, dialysis units in Northeast Indiana around Fort Wayne. And um, so back then, this is like 1978, 1979, she used to travel to different dialysis units, um, you know, like Tarabasco, Roanoke, Indiana, places like that, these little small towns. And we would visit people's houses, and I saw lots of big dialysis machines that were on blue shag carpet 
and um, you know, met many patients. And there were a few patients that um, actually did well on dialysis, and I got to be friends with them, and they sent me um, notes and stuff, you know, and lots of encouragement as I was um, early in my high school career. And everyone I was always saying, you know, you really have to do something to help these patients and, and um, prevent end stage renal disease was really kind of the thrust of it. And that's what my, uh, what my mom really wanted for me to do in my life. And um, so I ended up going into nephrology and um, it's been such a blessing. I've, I've just really have loved it. But I, I remember all those patients and um, I really want to try to use my time that I have here on this earth to do what my mom wanted, which was to help prevent <laughs> renal disease. Well, we're, we're very glad that you did. We're very, very, very glad that you did. Now, you told me I have to ask this question right up front. So right, right from the jump. Talk to us a little bit about the importance of patient advocacy in persuading legislators to make changes. Talk yeah. about the importance of why patient advocates are, are needed. I'm going to make a little bit so I don't get my kids in here. Um, yeah, so it is incredibly <laughs> important because, you know, other organizations have really made big strides um, for patients like the American Diabetes Association or the American Lung Association. And certainly um, people in the 1940s and 1950s who advocated for research for cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease that really helped to grow research investment in their disease. Um, so like, uh, you know, Vice President Joe Biden, you know, was a great advocate for cancer research, for example, and end up getting, you know, a lot of extra money allocated to cancer research, which has really had a tremendous impact on, on oncology and uh, many patients that I see that that probably would have died 10 years ago now are, are surviving and, and being cured. And so we really, um, we lack that major research investment in kidney disease. Um, we've just consistently lacked it, lacked it for decades. And what, what people are gonna really remember are patient stories or families of patient stories. So if I go into a con congressman's office and I talk about, you know, the importance of kidney disease, you know, I'm just a talking head. They're not interested in what I have to say because I haven't experienced kidney disease. I don't have a family member that has experienced kidney disease. And so the stories that, that are going to move Congress and senators to invest in kidney disease are the patients and the patient's families. So it's the voice of the patient and the voice of the patient's families that can really help get Congress to move and make changes. And what we really, really need is research investment, major research investment. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars a year added on to what we are already investing in kidney disease research. Because I can show you time and time again, when you put a lot of money into research investment, um, America is really good at finding innovations for that particular disease, whether it be cancer, cardiovascular disease, skin diseases, lung diseases, you name it. If you put research investment in there, you mm -hmm. will find innovation, you will find cures, and it can really make a major impact on kidney disease. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I wanted to ask you a question that's kind of off the books. It, it, it was something that um, I noticed uh, after we talked uh, yesterday. What is the NKF patient network? Uh, uh, some kind of registry or something? What, what is that about? Uh, yeah, so um, the patient registry is is a big investment from uh, many people who have, have, who have provided um, funding to create a patient network where patients can actually log into this patient network and they can provide information about um, trials that they might be interested in. And then um, they can be contacted to enroll in clinical trials across the whole US. And in addition, um, if you allow the, inf if you allow the patient innovation network to obtain your data, then that data can be put into a big pool that can actually be utilized for research. So for example, you know, many kidney diseases are uncommon and they affect only a few thousand people across the US every year. 
Um, and it's very difficult to do clinical trials in that if you're just looking at one particular area, like if you're just looking at Minnesota or you're just looking at the Chicagoland area, it's still even with that big of a population, it's hard to do a clinical trial. So you really need to pool centers across the entire US to get enough people to have enough power to detect differences for a particular treatment for a particular disease. So that patient network is gonna allow patients to register on this network and be contacted to be involved in, in clinical trials. So it's really exciting. And I think it's going to revolutionize research for kidney disease. Looking forward to it. You know, please keep mm -hmm. us updated on, on what's happening with that. Yeah. All right, Doc, let's, let's talk about the kidney transplant waiting list for a minute. There's almost 100,000 people on that list. Every month, you, you have told us that th they add 3,000 people. We lose 12 to 13 candidates every day that are waiting on that list. Discarded organs that could be usable uh, have, have not been used. Uh, your words, huge silos of healthcare providers who don't talk to each other, and, and, and therefore things like donor chains, paired donation, frequently don't come off because of uh, conflicts pre pre preventing access. What can we do, Dr. Kramer, to make the kidney transplant list shorter so we can maximize kidney transplants in the United States? Uh, so the National Kidney Foundation, along with like the American Society of Transplants and American Society of Transplant Surgeons, um, they are working together to try to um, improve the efficiency of the transplant process. So that comes from um, the organ procurement process um, to organ allocation and, um, and also to try to um, increase the number of centers that utilize those chains um, for living kidney donation. As far as the um, amount of organs that are discarded and not utilized, um, we really need to have a better communication between the practicing nephrologist, the patient, and the transplant um, nephrologist or transplant surgeon so that we are all on the same page as the type of organ that could be accepted for the patient. Um, and I think that patients really need to have better education about um, the, the reason why you might want to accept an, an organ that may not be absolutely perfect. Um, so I think there needs to be like better communication that co goes down to the, to the silos of, um, of medicine where you have, where we're not really communicating with each other. And I have seen where some um, uh, patients have kind of developed different methods of trying to um, improve communication across these silos. But so there's many, many steps that we need to take to increase the efficiency of organ procurement and organ allocation. And, and, and people are working on that um, as we speak. And I think 10 years from now, we're going to see that that wait list is, is less. Um, whether or not it's going to be you know 25% less is what you know the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative wants. But, um, but I think we can make many, many changes at different levels to improve that. And certainly the chain for living kidney donation is something that's really um, unique to certain centers across the US. And it requires special consent forms um, and might be a little bit um, an issue as far as the organizational structure for doing those chains, but it's something that certainly can be utilized at many more centers than what it is. And so that's one of the main things that uh, many of the transplant nephrologists that we've talked about, um, that they think that that's a main way that we can increase living kidney donation and, and use of living kidney uh, donors is by increasing the utilization of those chains at many more centers across the US. That's probably actually one of the easiest things that we can do to increase um, kidney transplantation. Okay. Doc, one of the things that we've talked about on the program before is the immunosuppressant bill that the, the NKF uh, is sponsoring and pushing. And the fact that Medicare only pays for the thir first 36 months after your transplant for immunosuppressants. 
Um, you have mentioned to, to us that a, a study was done that if Medicaid paid for all 10 years, for a decade's worth of immunosuppressants, Medicare could save close to $300 billion. And I know there are estimates that are, are higher than that. Can you please explain how Medicare can save on the cost of immunosuppressant medications? Because this is something, sure. you know, people try not to get transplanted because of these costs. So we, we want to alleviate those fears. What can we do? Right. Back? right. So um, if Medicare would pay for um, the, would pay mm -hmm. for the medications past the first 36 up a little bit. then if people would pay. I hear you. Okay. So um, if, if that, if immunosuppression is paid for the entire time that a person is on, uh, has the kidney transplant, then you would have a, a longer shelf life of most of these kidney transplants. I mean, many people start to ration their immunosuppressants after the first 36 months if they have a high copay or difficulty in paying for their, for their medications. And so then that leads to sort of like a smoldering rejection often where it may not go detected for many years until it's too late. Um, and then they end up needing a second or a third kidney transplant. And so that person just goes back on the waiting list, right? So then that means that you have more people who are then waiting for a second or third transplant. If we could just get more time out of that first kidney transplant, then, then people aren't gonna be going back and getting the second and third, and you have better opportunities for people to even get their first transplant. So that's the reason why it's cost saving because they know that the cost of immunosuppressants is a major issue for most people who get uh, kidney transplants. Um, and so it, I think we've seen great response to the immunosuppressant bill and we think that we may be able to actually get this passed at a national level this year and many states um, have passed it. Um, so uh, we've had a tremendous response. I know um, like I think Oklahoma might have been like the first state or maybe it was Idaho. Idaho was the first state to uh, to pass the immunosuppressant bill and many other states have subsequently passed it um, because of the actions of like the local um, National Kidney Foundation organization. So I think that we can get this passed this year at the national level because it is cost saving. It's cost saving. It makes no sense to give someone a kidney transplant and oh, we're not going to pay for your medication. No. So. Really and then you end up it. back on dialysis where they pay 100% of that and they, the cost of dialysis is so so, so high. It, right. It doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah, it makes no sense at all. Yeah. So um, everyone who has heard this, like on the Senate uh, Budget Appropriations Committee, when they gave testimony, Matt Cooper gave testimony, everyone who was on the committee just said, we need to make this happen. You know, it was, it was actually like one of the few times you saw a unification of the Democrats and Republicans, like everyone agreed that this is a win-win Party's situation. right. I, I remember the chairperson saying that this should happen. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Doc, are you still there? Uh-huh, yep. Hello. Okay. I'm here. Um, she's kind of frozen up a little bit, Steve. Um, let me ask this. There are, are 37 million chronic disease patients, chronic kidney disease patients in the United States. 80% of those dialysis patients are catheterized when they started dialysis, indicating that this was emergency treatment. In other words, it's just like I talked about at the beginning of the show. The poor guy fell out of bed, and the next thing he knows, he's being catheterized and put on dialysis. Medicare expenditures for all kidney patients is $120 billion, with a B, dollars. CKD is 34% of the Medicare budget. I, I've heard you in your plenary talk say this is not sustainable. As advocates, how do we make people more aware of the benefits of testing for CKD, the benefits of early detection and treatment? What, what can we do to make the public more aware of what's going on? Well, first of all, we really need to get kidney disease in the minds of more Americans, right? And that's the reason why um, part of the Advancing American Kidney Health Presidential Order was to increase public awareness of kidney disease. So most people just even forget that that organ exists. 
So um, the National Kidney Foundation um, did launch a public awareness campaign just to get people thinking about kidney disease and to get high risk people to be screened for kidney disease. But because of the pandemic, that, um, that awareness campaign had to be paused and we're hoping to get that campaign restarted sometime in the fall. Um, and certainly the COVID-19 epidemic has, has even broadened the, the importance of, of kidney disease and really emphasizes the timeliness of people being aware of, of kidney disease. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but so that'd be the first thing is just really increasing awareness of kidney disease. Um, we really lack clinical trials that show the benefits and cost effectiveness of screening for kidney disease in certain populations. And so right now we're really just focused on screening people who have, who have diabetes. But what really should happen is anyone who has a family history of kidney disease should be screened for kidney disease. Um, certainly if you have you know, really poorly controlled hypertension, if you have diabetes, you should be screened. So there's many groups who, who, who should be screened and who are not being screened. And even among people who have diabetes. Hypertension, know, diabetes. Right. People so even that have people, uh, right, and even the like people myself. who have diabetes who should be screened, they're not being screened adequately. They're not getting the full complement of tests that they should be getting. And if they are getting it, they are probably not even getting it annually. And then if we get the test, they're not getting like the diagnosis that hey, your GFR is low or your albumin to creatinine ratio is high. So the, the laboratory data then are not being translated to an actual clinical diagnosis and treatment. So um, as, as I said in the plenary session, you know, it's about 85% of people who have kidney disease still to this day are unaware that they have it. So um, we've made- That they have or could have. Treatment. Right, right. So um, I think- you know, yeah, Doc, I think let's talk about a uh, lot more. funding for kidney research. You have made the point that there is lack of adequate funding for kidney research. For example, the NIH has invested in research for cardiovascular disease, and there's a decline of 80% in that disease. Research in cancer has saved 2.6 million lives since 1991. Cancer research is funded tenfold more than kidney disease. The, there are 37 million people with CKD. There are 34 million people with diabetes. But funding for diabetes research is about twice uh, what that is for kidney disease. You've told us that the low levels of kidney research re re reflects in that nephrology has the lowest levels done. And the effect of that is that there are less researchers, there are less people, less doctors going into nephrology. Morality is not improving. The survival of kidney patients is not improving. CKD morality is up 65%. Cancer is down 450%. Cardiovascular is down 800% between 2003 and 2013. Doc, how do we get the funding for kidney disease up? How do we encourage more, more research? How do we get more uh, researchers like yourself? How do we get more nephrologist doctors to take care of people like me? How do we do that? Well, if the answer isn't in me, the answer is actually in you and people like you. So this is where patient advocates can uh, make the difference. So if I go to Congress and I say, hey, I do research and it's really hard to get the funding to do research, they don't want to hear it. They, they you know, I'm, I'm just a number. But if, if you go to Congress and you tell them your story and um, tell them how you think that if we invested in research, we could prevent more people from going through the same thing that you had to go through, um, you know, they'll, they'll listen to that. And that's what we need. We need people who have suffered with kidney disease and who have survived kidney disease or family members who have seen a loved one on dialysis um, or people who have gone through a kidney transplant. We need you to talk to your senator and talk to your congressperson 
about the lack of research funding for kidney disease. And I mean, it's just as simple as that. For kidney disease. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's kidney disease okay. um, has the lowest amount of research. Yeah. Okay. Are you there, Doc? Did we lose uh -huh. you? Nope. I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, another question off the beaten path. Talk to us a little bit about the Virtual Kidney Patient Social Summit. What, what is that all about? The virtual what? The Virtual Kidney Patient Social Summit. I've been, I've been getting mailing on it lately from the NKF. Apparently you guys are, are, are doing an entire summit online. Ah, is that correct? I see. Okay, that's the first I've heard that it's gonna be completely online, but that makes sense. So I think it's just, um, you know, in the past we had a kidney summit where you're trying to advocate um, for kidney disease. And usually that's done in DC. And of course, last year we had to cancel it. It was in March, it was like around March 15th, I think. And um, so all of that was like canceled at the last minute and um, no one could go. And that was a real problem because we were really hoping that we could really push our immunosuppressant bill um, through at that time. But um, so yeah, so I think if you can, uh, if you have time to do it virtually, I think that's great. And maybe having it virtual will allow more people to be involved. Um, and and they can, um, and I would encourage everyone to be involved in this virtual summit, because if you haven't done advocacy work before, then you can learn how to be an advocate for, for kidney disease. Um, so I hope everyone does join this. I didn't know that it was going to be virtual, but that totally makes sense. And I think that's great. <laughs> Surprises from Uncle Jim tonight. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the May 21st letter that the, the NKF and the American Society of mm -hmm. Nephrologists sent to Secretary Azar with Health and, and, and Human Services. And your signature appears on that letter. So I, I, I know you know what's going on. Um, the letter talks about kidney patients' needs in light of the coronavirus and the steps that the administration needs to take to, to help kidney patients. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that the letter talks about is the need to treat CKD patient, end-stage renal disease patient, and transplant patients as quote-unquote vulnerable to, to COVID-19. Can you, you please talk to us about that? Why do you consider kidney patients to be vulnerable to the virus? Well, definitely patients who do dialysis, do in-center dialysis, they're gonna be traveling to and from a dialysis unit. So they're constantly exposed to healthcare workers and maybe to travel personnel. So they're leaving their home several times a week so every time they leave their home, of course, they're increasing their risk of being exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the COVID-19 disease, right? So, um, so they're very vulnerable, but we also know that kidney disease um, and people with end-stage renal disease are even earlier stages of kidney disease and patients who have a, a kidney transplant are at higher risk of developing, you know, severe outcomes, you know, having the virus really be difficult to fight against. So it might require hospitalization. People may get very short of breath and maybe require oxygen. You could also develop kidney injury if you're not on dialysis. Um, you know, your kidney function could get worse if you get the COVID-19. So that's the reason why we call them vulnerable. So not only that the dialysis patients have a higher risk of of being exposed to the virus, but then that if you do get COVID-19, that you could have a hard time fighting the virus. So, so yeah, we're, we're strongly advocating for the um, Department of Health and Human Services to really look at people with kidney disease as a population that should be strongly protected. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I, I've noticed that some, some of the, the COVID patients uh, they tell us develop kidney disease. And I noticed that out of, out of New York that uh, you have told us 20 to 40 percent of the COVID emergency room patients develop kidney failure and need emergency dialysis. That's, that's also a consideration, too, is it not? 
Yes. So um, kidney, acute kidney injury is really common um, in people who are sick enough to be hospitalized. So if you look around the intensive care unit, um, you might see at least maybe about 10 percent, up to even 40 percent of those people who are in the ICU um, have uh, kidney problems. And some of them even require dialysis. And I was actually talking to some people um, at Mount Sinai this morning, and they're saying how, you know, they're seeing a lot of people who were discharged from the hospital um, who now return for follow up. And many of those people now have chronic kidney disease because of, of COVID-19, right? So, so anyone who has, who already has some pre-existing kidney disease, you always worry about losing more kidney disease, more kidney function, right? You want to try to maintain the kidney function that you have so you don't need dialysis or a kidney transplant. So we're really concerned that if you get COVID-19, it would further damage your kidneys. Excellent. The letter also talks about morality uh, rates for kidney patients. Uh, dialysis patients who develop the virus, the virus in the range of 10 to 20 percent. Kidney transplant patients as high as 30 percent. Can you tell us why is this significant and, and what is the National Kidney Foundation urging be done about it? Well, um, certainly what we're um, urging patients to do um, is to continue to stay safe. So even as states reopen, we really think that patients who have kidney disease, especially if you have a kidney transplant or if you're on dialysis, do not start going, you know, shopping, you know, when you don't need to, don't go to restaurants and bars and, you know, you need to continue to quarantine yourself as much as possible, unfortunately. So I've had patients ask me, you know, hey, can I, can I go on my Caribbean cruise this summer? Can I, you know, can I go on a plane and go visit my sister in California? And the answer is no, um, because of the vulnerability of patients who have kidney disease to having bad outcomes with COVID-19. So unfortunately, you have to still maintain social distance and um, continue to quarantine as much as you can. Okay, okay. No, Steve, my mic's fine. Uh, can you hear me, Steve? I hope so. C can you hear me, doctor? Yeah, it's a little different, but I can still hear you. Okay. Um, should kidney patients be included in this vulnerable individuals group as part of the special population that's susceptible to COVID-19? And if so, why? Why should patients with kidney disease be considered the special population? Yes, ma'am. Yes, because, yes, they should, because they, we, know, we know from data from, even from Wuhan, China, um, in addition to um, data from like New York um, that has come out um, that that there's a high mortality rate, just like you said, you know, patients who are on dialysis, the mortality rate might be 10 to 20 percent. Um, patients with uh, kidney transplant might even be a little bit higher because you're on the immunosuppressants. So, um, yes, yeah, so anyone with kidney disease should be considered a, a space, special population, vulnerable population, and they should continue to try to quarantine themselves as much as possible. The, the things that, that are recommended in, in the letter, masking, social distancing, uh, shelter in place. Can you talk to us a little bit about why kidney patients should continue to shelter in place? So, yeah, so the shelter in place is, is still really important just because of the extremely high risk of having bad outcomes, meaning that you'd be hospitalized in the intensive care unit, could lose kidney function. Like if you have a kidney transplant, you could lose your kidney transplant um, or you can lose the kidney function that you may have. Um, a dialysis patient, you know, we certainly worry about like needing intubation or even death with, with COVID-19. I mean, it's, it's extremely serious. It's not something that you should take any risk. 
So um, if you do have to go out to the grocery store, I would suggest try to go during times when it's gonna be less populated, go like late at night or really early in the morning, definitely wear a mask um, and then make sure, you know, like you wash your hands uh, real good when you get home or as soon as you get in the car, I always put a lot of hand gel um, as soon as I get in the car. Um, but you know, try. You can't. You still cannot go and hang out with family. You can't go out to a restaurant, or you shouldn't go out to a restaurant. Shouldn't go to the movie theater. All those things. You need to continue to shelter in place because of the high risk of bad outcomes if you do get infected. I'm not saying that everyone has a bad outcome, but just the risk is just so much higher if you have kidney disease. Doc, for our, our friends that are dialysis patients and kidney transplant patients, we have a lot of contact with healthcare personnel. How do, how do we continue to isolate and keep a proper social distance on one hand and on the other hand, uh, do things like take our dialysis or get our blood drawn uh, as kidney transplant patients? How, how does that work? Yeah, so, um, so I think that that, the risk is a little bit lower with the healthcare personnel because, you know, every time I walk in the door, they screen me. Um, I'm also required to wear a mask and I also wash my hands a lot. So those three steps really help to mitigate the risk of, of getting um, exposure to the virus from a healthcare personnel because they're trying to make sure that no sick healthcare personnel come to work. Um, and they're also making sure that everyone is, is wearing a mask. So I think that that's better. You know, it's like when you go out to a restaurant, you know, you, you know, there might be someone there who, who has a bad cough and they don't care. They still go out to the restaurant. So I think that the risk is lower when you're, when you're going to a clinic or, or to a lab. So there's that is going on. Um, but also remember, you still have to take care of, of your health. But if you can interact with your uh, providers via phone or telehealth, I would do that. I would, you know, instead of going face-to-face -face clinic, just ask them, is it okay if we just do a telephone or a video visit? And a lot of times it's totally fine. Um, as far as the labs, um, you know, you can certainly get your labs done, um, you know, a time when there's not a lot of people around. And I think a lot of labs are trying to make sure that you're not sitting in a waiting room, you know, with other people. Um, and then there are, if you're a transplant patient, I know that there are some companies that um, can come out to your house and, and draw your blood that way. But I don't, I don't know if that's even better. You're still having someone come into your house, but you still have to take care of your health. Certainly you can try to use telephone or video visit, um, you know, to try to mitigate that risk. Okay. One of the, the things that, that you mentioned early on in our conversation tonight was the issue that dialysis patients have with safe transportation back and forth to dialysis. Can you talk to us about how we do that in, in the age of COVID? Yeah, that's really tough, isn't it? Um, and I know I've also heard that some patients have a hard time um, getting transportation like if, especially if they're, if they have COVID-19, then no one was willing to pick them up and they might even miss treatments. Um, and I know that the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology have, you know, sent a letter of concern, you know, to the Department of Health and Human Services that's saying that, you know, really need to make sure that patients can still get um, transportation to and from dialysis. Um, but I would say, you know, just make sure you wear a mask and ask them to wear a mask as well. So, um, and then just try to, you know, use as much distance as, as possible from, from the driver is what I would suggest. But make sure that the driver is wearing a mask because you wearing a mask is really protecting the other person. So you want the other people who are around you to wear a mask to protect yourself. So that's one thing I would I would say is never get in a car or bus or something if the bus driver and stuff are not wearing a mask. I, I have read, Doc, that if you're wearing a mask and the other guy is wearing a mask, there's less than a 1% chance of transmission of, of that disease. Is, is that a correct statement or is that near correct? 
I don't know about that. I haven't heard about that. Um, but I do know that, you know, if you're wearing a mask, a surgical mask, then you're, you reduce transmission by 50%. So I assume like if the other person is wearing a mask and they're, they're, you know, and reduce it by 50%, then maybe that could happen in 1%. I haven't heard that, but it's really, it does, it does make a huge difference. If everyone's wearing a mask, it's going to really help to reduce reduce transmission of the virus. And then, then it also helps to make sure that people who have overt symptoms like a cough and a fever, because those people are the ones who transmit the most virus. You know, those that's the worst is if someone is actively sick. So making sure that anyone who feels sick doesn't drive the bus and doesn't come to work, you know, that also is another way to really help reduce, reduce exposure as well. Uh, part of the symptoms that, that you talked about, one of the other symptoms that you mentioned as a telltale symptoms in one of your talks is, is having the chills. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so the CDC actually added that to their list of symptoms, I think something like a month ago, because um, at first they were really focused on like fever, cough, and shortness of breath. But they found you know, that the, the way that people exhibit symptoms uh, from the COVID-19 is, is really variable. So I know some people that all they had was maybe a little bit of fever, chills, and diarrhea. Other people uh, might have had just like a dry cough and no fever whatsoever. But a lot of people do have chills. So even if you don't have a fever, you may just feel like you're developing a fever and you have the chills. Um, but your body is able to fight off the virus. You never develop a fever. So um, that's one thing to think about. So like uh, unexplained headache, especially like headache with chills. Um, think about that. Sore throat. Um, you can get um, like you know, large lymph nodes under your um, chin here, which is that your body's trying to fight off that virus. Um, usually the cough is going to be dry. You're not coughing up a lot of stuff. It's just a dry, nagging cough. Um, and, and fever would be something that would really make you think that you may have the virus because, you know, most colds and stuff we get, we don't get a, a fever with it. Um, but I think especially like if you're a transplant recipient, you know, you're on immunosuppressants, you may not get a fever. So if there's any change in your health status, you know, consider the COVID-19 and think about and think about getting screened, you know. So like if you were doing fine, all of a sudden now you had chills and maybe body aches, think of the COVID-19. You may not ever get a fever. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, one of the other items discussed in, in the letter, and we talked about the NKF's petition a little bit tonight before you were on the air. We talked a little bit about the safe resumption of elective surgeries needed for dialysis access, peritoneal dialysis access, uh, decedent kidney transplants, for example. Can you talk to us about the need to resume these elective surgeries or so-called elective surgeries? Right, um, so I have like, for example, I have a patient who um, around March was scheduled to get her AV graft um, kind of redone because the first one that, she, that they put in, it caused like a steel syndrome and she wasn't able to use her left hand anymore. And, and she had a lot of pain. Um, and it was something that I considered to be really an urgent and necessary surgery. Um, but because of the COVID-19 epidemic, it was, it was put off. And so this, this person then you know, has persistent pain in her hand, she can't use her hand, and, and then she has a catheter in. Um, and um, so I was really upset that that, all, that that surgery got delayed. But those are the types of necessary surgeries that many of our patients need. And we need to make sure that they can obtain those surgeries in a safe way without getting exposed to the COVID-19 virus. So this really requires hospital systems to implement um, efficient testing of, of the virus so that if you're going to be admitted to the hospital, you're tested to make sure we're not bringing COVID-19 patients into the hospital and you don't know it and they're sitting in, you know, in a shared room or something or going into an operating room and contaminating an operating room and the surgeons and things like that. So it, it requires like a systematic approach 
to make sure that people who come in for elective surgery can get it, obtain it safely. And so th that that requires, um, you know, help from state and, and national governments to provide guidance on that. So, um, so that's one of the things that we ask the Department of Health and Human Services to really help with that to make sure that our patients are able to get these necessary surgeries like getting PD catheters placed or replaced, getting fistulas and AV grafts and, and getting transplants uh, as well. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, please talk about the importance of ensuring that hospitals and dialysis centers have enough of an adequate supply of dialysis equipment and solution to provide for dialysis patients. Right. So, you know, so there's really a, a, an issue of the fact that I think people were not anticipating the high rate of kidney failure that would occur in these really sick patients in the ICU with COVID-19. So, um, so it, it really kind of, I think, su surprised the community. There was a lot of emphasis on making sure we have enough ventilators, but what they didn't think about is the fact we also need enough dialysis machines. And then for the dialysis machines, a lot of them, if you're too sick to do the regular dialysis, then you need the slow dialysis that requires these big bags of fluid. And you can go through like 12 of those bags a day. So, um, so we found that there was uh, somewhat of a shortage, especially in certain areas that were hit very hard, you know, like Brooklyn or places like that. Um, so we have asked them to really help with this because it's sort of like a complex interplay of, of making sure you have enough of the supplies and the machines because there's only two companies that make the supplies and the machines. And it's not like you can just, you know, up upregulate the number of those machines available to people. They're expensive. Um, so we really need help from HHS to ensure that there, that there is enough supplies as, as we have these, you know, uprising of COVID-19 cases uh, across the country. Um, so, you know, there is a way that you can kind of, you know, you can ration things a little bit, but that's really not what we should be doing. We should be making sure that we provide the best possible care for all of our patients who have who have kidney failure. So, so I think that the Department of Health and Human Services really understands the problem, and and they're and they're trying to address it to try to um, help make sure that we have enough machines and supplies um, for you know that we can share across the country. Okay, Doc, talk to us a little bit about what risk stratified means and high priority means when it comes to testing of, of, of kidney patients? So risk stratified or high priority just means that you're trying to pick up those patients who have the highest risk um, and you're trying to really protect those patients first. So you're trying to really prioritize if we have a limited number of COVID-19 test kits, you know, who should we screen first? So I would argue that we really want to try to look at those populations um, who, if they get the disease, they may have a high risk of, of doing poorly. So, I've, so the NKF and ASN have really advocated to try to really focus on, on patients who have kidney disease as a population that's vulnerable for bad outcomes with COVID-19. So it would be great if we could screen all of the dialysis healthcare workers so that we could find those who are positive and isolate them and get them away from the patients. And the same thing with the patients. Like if we find patients who are, who are positive for the virus, that we make sure that we, you know, get them uh, quarantined away from those patients who don't have it to try to limit the spread of that virus um, among our patients and our, and our healthcare providers. So that's why we say risk stratified is to really try to look at the at the patient population who is highest risk or vulnerable, um, and that would be patients who you know had a kidney transplant or who are on dialysis or even those who have non-dialysis dependent kidney disease. Okay, let's talk about vaccination and vaccines for a minute, Doctor. Um, one of the points that 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 you have made is that it's gonna take 12 to 18 months for a vaccine to be developed. When it's due or, or when it's ready, because of the susceptibility that 
kidney patients have, they should be quote unquote, first in line to be vaccinated. Can you explain that please? Right, so that all goes to the vulnerability of the population. So in addition to that, we should you know, test these, we should really try to do a lot more testing so that we limit the spread of the virus. Once we get the vaccine, again, we need to go back to our vulnerable patients population and try to make sure that they get the vaccine first. So we shouldn't be, you know, going around and vaccinating healthy young people who have a very low risk of bad outcomes with COVID-19. If we have a limited amount of vaccine, then we need to really prioritize the vulnerable patient populations and make sure that they get it first. And that would mean patients with kidney disease should be vaccinated first in line. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Steve, how are we doing for time? Are we okay for time, Steve? All right, let, let me ask this. Um, okay. I was at a kitchen cabinet meeting recently with, um, Steve says time's okay. I was at a kitchen cabinet meeting recently for the, the NKF. And one of the things that was brought up is the patients that have developed COVID and, and then ACI as a, a result, were placed on peritoneal dialysis, and then they were sent home. Unfortunately, they may or may not have had adequate training. They may or may not have had adequate supervision at home. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? What, what safety, members, safety measures should be implemented to improve home dialysis for these type of patients? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, when, when this epidemic started, I mean, we're all sort of just learning as we go. We're learning about the virus and we're learning um, how to deal with um, the kidney failure that came up. And so I know in some areas, many patients who develop kidney failure because of COVID-19 um, got put on peritoneal dialysis in the hospital or when they were discharged, they were you know, put on peritoneal dialysis in order to keep them at home. And certainly, as you said, it's really, really important that people know what to do, right? So if you don't know how to do the, the peritoneal dialysis and you do it wrong, then certainly you can develop an infection and you're just gonna end up back in the hospital. Um, so uh, I know that there are many organizations that are really trying to um, rev up education of professionals about um, peritoneal dialysis. And there's been many free webinars that have been offered by several societies to try to do, do better training of healthcare personnel on how to train the patients um, on um, home dialysis. But I also think it would be great if we could try to get um, you know, more healthcare personnel to maybe visit a patient you know, a couple times after they're discharged to make sure that they are doing okay with the home dialysis. That would be that would be super. It doesn't that's that's not in place right now, but I think that's something that we should think about advocating for if we're going to be using a lot more um, home dialysis. And and many patients may not feel comfortable if it's if it's started very rapidly um, and they don't have a lot of, of training. But that that is a difficult yeah. problem. Okay, um, Doc, we talked a lot about elective surgery and I noticed in, in the letter there's a term reentry guidance. What does the term reentry guidance refer to? So reentry has to do with the fact that you know we've been in, we've been in quarantine now where we're, we're social distancing ourselves and businesses and stuff are not open. But reentry is then as we start to reopen restaurants, we start to open businesses, um, and, and people are, are starting to kind of come out of their houses. And so there's going to be more, more risk of exposure to the virus for all of us during reentry if we don't do it safely. And so we really need to think again about our vulnerable patient population when we start to do reentry, you know. So um, that's why we're, to get, you know, I'm giving advice to patients. Um, who are on dialysis or who have a kidney transplant to maintain that social distancing, maintain, stay at home as much as possible during reentry. So while everyone else may be going out and getting their nails done and their hair done, if you're a dialysis patient, you're a transplant patient, 
don't do that. You know, you need to continue to stay at home to protect yourself. So reentry just means kind of like the opening up of the businesses and the communities um, again. Okay. Doc, we've talked a little bit about medications and the 90 day rule with sending medications to kidney transplant patients. In the correspondence, the May 20th correspondence, there's reference to an extension of time for an emergency period of this 90 day supply period. Can you explain why kidney transplant patients might need an extension of time? Well, you're talking about the 90 day rule extension? Yes, yes. Yeah. So all that's just saying is that, you know, we don't want patients during, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic to be having to go to CVS pharmacy or Walgreens or whatever pharmacy every 30 days. It makes no sense. So we ask for uh, all medications then to be a 90 day supply so that people aren't having to, you know, get out of their house all the time. So some of these rules, it just it seems so silly that we have to argue for this, you know? It seems like, you know, we shouldn't have to advocate that. This seems like common sense that all medication supplies should be maybe even more than 90 days during the pandemic. Maybe we should give out a six month supply, you know, um, in order to help patients uh, avoid having to come out of their house and expose themselves. Okay. Doc, uh, one final thing I, I, I wanted to uh, talk to you about and to plug. Um, at the beginning of the show, I talked a little bit about the petition from uh, the National Kidney Foundation. Can you, you, you tell us why this petition is important and why all, the, all our kidney patients and, and people affected by kidney disease should sign this petition? That is so great that you're talking about the petition. So last I heard, we had um, 5,000 signatures on, on that petition. Um, and I think when, um, when I was first talking about it, there's only like a thousand people that were on the petition. So I think you know, you've done a great job in getting the word out about this petition. And, but the petition is really is, is saying all the things that you've talked about tonight, about how we are a vulnerable patient population and that we need to be protected. And, and it's just really advocating for the kidney disease population during the COVID-19 epidemic, right? So it's saying that um, they need to be protected, um, need to make sure that you have access to um, the surgeries that you need for your health, and that you know when there is a vaccine, you be prioritized to get that vaccine um, so that you can then you know hopefully return to a normal life again. Um, so that petition is incredibly important, and the more the people that are on there, the the bigger that vote looks like, the stronger that group looks like. So if you haven't yet signed that petition, please go and sign that petition and ask your family members to sign on. Um, it's incredibly important. I'm so glad you're talking about that. So do you have like a link to that petition that you're sending people tonight or? Uh, we'll take care of that, that doc. Uh, oh, there it is. We, we'll make sure that, that people get, get that link in. Um, I just wanted to point out some of the things that are, are discussed in that position, access to PPE, prioritizing testing, testing patients in nursing home, critical elective surgeries going forward, 90 days of medical supply, non-emergency transportation, resuming safe organ transplantation. These are all important things to kidney patients and to kidney advocates. So please sign, share, encourage others to do the same. Doc, I'm out of questions. I, I appreciate you, you, you taking time. I'm, I, I'm sorry this is, went a little longer than what we anticipated. Uh, thanks to, to Steve Belcher and the uh, Urban Network for letting us go a, a little bit over. And uh, I greatly appreciate the president of the National Kidney Foundation uh, coming on with us tonight to, to talk about kidney advocacy. Appreciate it so very much, Dr. Holly. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. We will. Have a good night, everybody. Steve, we're done.